Hello everyone, and we are back for another talk during our virtual developers conference 2020. Um, I'm your host Jockey, and with me is Shevin. Hello. Shevin, what's what's up on the menu? Who are we going to welcome now? Yeah, next on the menu we have Kobus, who will be cooking some automating your cloud stuff about what are the building blocks for cloud automation. That sounds great. So, Kobus is already in line. Hello, Kobus. Thank you very much for joining and being part of this um, event. And please introduce yourself and uh, okay. let's go. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so just quickly before we get to a bit about me, uh, today's talk is going to be focusing on how to automate your cloud and specifically your cloud journey around that and looking at some of the building blocks of things that I've seen over the years that people tend to need to automate, which they often don't because it does take a lot of time. So firstly, a little bit about me um, before we kick things off. So I am a senior developer advocate with AWS. Um, and before that, that I and I stopped counting there because I'm now not a, no longer a developer. I'm now a marketing person apparently for my sins. Um, one of those fun things. Um, so I was a developer for 15 years. That a lot of uh, various different developers: Java, C Sharp, Linux, Windows, uh, mobile development, uh, and they started doing quite a lot of automation in about the last five six years because I found that uh, developers don't want to actually you know automate their code. They just want to write the code and get it out there. Uh, Prior to joining AWS, um, I actually was a customer of AWS for eight years, building multiple different types of systems there from FinTech um, to money managing systems, uh, some healthcare products, et cetera. Uh, you can see all my social handle details there at the bottom. If you want to follow me or ask me any questions afterwards, I will touch on that a little bit closer to the end. Uh, then also a fun little bit here is that the picture that you see in the bottom right is actually my roof. And unfortunately, if you look at that image from Google Earth, you can't really uh, see it properly. So a little bit disappointed there, but still awesome thing about um, my roof. And also, if you're wondering where I'm from, uh, Cape Town. So this is where the fairly recently launched uh, AWS region in Cape Town is. Um, well, I don't live in it, but close to it. So getting back to the talk, we're going to be talking about automation building blocks. So obviously, people are thinking, well, this is what we're going to do. We are going to be automating everything. And mm, don't want to spoil the fun, but close. We will be automating most things. But before we get there, let's quickly take a look at what we will be covering today. So firstly, I just want to touch on exactly or a definition of DevOps um, because there's a lot of confusion around that. And firstly, automation doesn't mean DevOps. Uh, then we're going to go into infrastructure as code, some of the concepts around that and how that actually plays into this um, strategy of your building blocks for your cloud and how you should be thinking about automating and approaching infrastructure as code. Uh, then we're going to touch a little bit on um, what's called the golden path in terms of um, how you create this roadmap for people to automate and what they should be doing. Uh, and with that, we're going to take a look as um, on, with VM images as well as with containers, how you build this golden path. Then we're going to take a quick uh, detour around deployments and talking about deployments and how your automation factors into that, because there are some fun things out there um, with regards to, for example, using Docker Latest that people might not be aware of. And then lastly, we're going to wrap things up with uh, a quick look at configuration management and where does that play into your automation of the cloud and your journey around that. So. Firstly, DevOps is not a sysadmin that is now suddenly doing some cloud work. Often people think this, but it's not that. It's also not people just automating the cloud. Um, once again, there's a lot of job offers in the market where they say we're looking for a DevOps engineer, but they're actually just looking for someone to automate some stuff in the cloud. It's also not someone who just sets up some CI CD pipeline. So the best um, definition of um, what DevOps is comes from a talk that I saw way back in 2016 by Dan Moore, and he used the acronym CAMS, um, which is DevOps is not a tool. It's not a um, it's not a you know specific job description. It's more of a philosophy slash culture, um, and the C stands for the culture. So companies adopting um, rapid change, uh, enabling the developers to actually spin up their own infrastructure, configure their own infrastructure, own it, etc. Uh, a big part of it, which a lot of people are familiar with, is automation. And the reason automation is important is that we've often seen documents like this. And I've actually worked at companies where there was a playbook to set up a server. And it literally had 600 individual steps that were documented one by one in a Word document. And your responsibility when you set up a new server was to follow this literally step by step. And if you find a mistake, you had to update the document and then also have someone else work with you to validate that that change is correct. Now, obviously, that doesn't scale. So think about automation. 
Uh, then also a very important part about DevOps is measuring things because you don't want to be like this person where you say like, I made things faster and faster by this much. Wave your hands a little bit. And uh, yeah, the reason for this is that you want to uh, provide value to the company. So let's say you go to your manager or boss and say, listen, I'm going to spend some time to automate this one section because I want to make things faster. And they go, okay, cool, but how much faster is it going to be? They're like, no, no, just trust me, it's going to be faster. That is a little bit hard to sell. Whereas if you've done this before, you can say, well, currently our build takes uh, 37 minutes to do. Um, and I am able to take this down to probably about one minute or 30 seconds if I can get, do the following things. Now, now that's easier sell because now you've convinced your um, manager or boss saying, listen, there's a, a tangible, measurable value. So they can see the value in this and that's how you get things done. So always make sure that you're able to measure because also if you don't measure, you can't improve and you can't know what the improvement was. Because uh, like I said, hand-waving doesn't work that well here. Uh, then the last part of the sharing portion, we actually share your knowledge and learnings with the rest of the team and the organization. Um, and just a nice way to show this is for those not familiar with XKCD, um, it's an online cartoon by a mathematician and lots of interesting wisdom in there. And we are actually going to be using quite a few of these slides today. So this slide specifically, what it boils down to is that when somebody asks a question and say, I didn't know about, know about this, you go, instead of going like, what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? Everybody knows this. That's a bad experience. And then we are training people to say, well, I don't ask questions because people, you know, snub me and I don't learn anything because they're just rude. Instead saying, oh, let me take this opportunity to cheat you because it is so much fun. And just quickly for those not familiar with this specific uh, Diet Coke and Mentos things, here's a quick little video to show you what happens. Um, basically, all the gas comes out in one go and you get these massive explosions. So you even have people using this to do um, large demonstrations and have a lot of fun. But that's beside the point for today, except that it's fun. So what is our goal with automation? Because um, we still haven't answered that. Well, an easy definition is that we want to have our developers be this happy. So they should be happy to spin up new infrastructure. They should be happy to um, build a new service and roll things out. We want them happy because with automation, they can be happy. So we're back again. Are we going to be automating everything? Um, no. The reason for this is, once again, XKCD, is that this is a nice... Um, joke around how people think automation works. It's like you're going to uh, automate something because it takes a bit of time and you spend a bit more time than you would listen on, on the start of the task. And by the end, because it's automate, uh, automated, you now have got so much free time, you can do all those other things that you never get to. And the reality is, as you can see at the bottom, you often end up spending a lot more time automating things than you do on the actual task itself. So third XKCD for the day. Yes, we're going through this quickly. Well, at least this talk. I don't know if others have actually used it today. Um, this is a very, very handy chart that um, uh, the author actually created. And what this chart does is, if we look at a specific cell over here, it is a comparison between how long does a task take and how often do you that, do that task. And then if you think about the next five years, now just quickly take a pause here. And this is normally where I get audience interaction saying, hey, who's written code that's been running a production for more than five years? Um, interesting response there is often people don't realize that the code won't run that long. Your code might not um, run for five years. So automation. Let's say I've got a task that I do daily and it takes me 30 seconds. If I spend more than 12 hours automating that task, and if you think 12 hours, that's what, uh, two, three work days, depending on how efficient you are and how much time you dedicate per day on it. Um, if you spend more time than that automating this, you would actually spend more time automating it than you would save over the next five years. Let that sink in for a moment. Five years. What are the chances of whatever it is you're automating right now is going to be out there in five years? Take that into account as well. Similarly, for example, if you look at something that you do 50 times a day and it only takes a second, and these are the things that often kill us, which is something you constantly do um, by hand and you can automate it somehow. If you do this 50 times a day, well, you should be spending at least a day or you can spend a day on it in terms of the amount of time that you'll save. And then lastly, obviously something you do uh, that takes five seconds that you do 30 times a day. Oh, uh, sorry, that you do once a day, that'll allow you to spend two hours on it, which once again, saving five seconds once a day is not that much. So, cool. What are we going to talk about? We are talking about building block automation. So a big part of that is automating your infrastructure. Um, the reason is that a lot of systems are built on the cloud nowadays and old days where you had a physical server and um, I recently learned the, learned the term box hacker um, is no longer the case. So um, you want to be able to spin these up quickly and easily. So you want to automate that. So this is where infrastructure as code comes in. Now, you might have heard this term before, so I just want to quickly walk through what it is and what it means, um, and also a little bit of history, uh, because not everyone is familiar with it. Well, what it is, um, 
is as a mechanism to actually allow you to define your infrastructure using normal code. So text file, you commit that to some kind of repository, someone reviews it, etc. Now, initially when the tooling for infrastructure as code came out, it, they were written in an imperative language. So what we mean by this is that you give the tool steps. So step A, B, C, and D. Do them in this order and only this order and start at step A. Um, that's a problem. Because what happened if the system changed since you initially planned to run step A? So remember that long uh, 600 uh, point installation doc? What happened if something like the installation process changed or they added a step to the installation? That's where things start breaking. So imperative, yes, it was a good start. It helped us, but it didn't really solve the problem. And what we are seeing now with tools nowadays is that they use the declarative language. So rather than saying do this and that, we say I want this. I want a VPC. I want five um, web servers spun up behind a load balancer. We don't necessarily, well, we do care about how that's done, but we don't uh, want to plan out the initial steps. So the tooling takes care of figuring out where I'm at the moment, where do I want to go, and what's this delta in the middle that I need to uh, do or, or to apply to actually get us to that end state that we want to be. So if you take a look at, for example, a typical VPC layout in AWS, this is a VPC in a region. We've got three availability zones. Each AZ has got multiple subnets, private and public. There are routing tables. There are private routing tables, NAT gateways, etc. These are a lot of components. And where infrastructure as code makes it a lot easier is that instead of clicking and setting all of this up by hand, because this will take you a while, and yes, I know, because I initially did this by hand, um, you use your infrastructure as code tooling. So this is a code sample from AWS CDK. And if you look at that line, and that's the only one I want you to look at, is that that single line that you see there will set up the, um, the infrastructure that I just showed you. So this is where infrastructure as code really starts becoming powerful. And you can see the different tools. There are a lot of different tools. For example, Terraform. Um, I'm currently doing a lot of videos on YouTube on Terraform because it's um, a product that I used uh, for about five, six years before joining AWS. Also, infrastructure as tools, slightly different angle. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can actually do infrastructure as code. So go have a look and play with those tools. Because once again, here you've got a chunk of code, and this actually does all of those steps that you had before. Simplifies your life. So in summary, quickly. What are the goals with infrastructure as code? Uh, the first one is that we want to make changes repeatable and predictable. Uh, the big part here is that you definitely don't want to, on a Friday, go, hey, I'm going to make this infrastructure change to our service, and, uh, you know, I hope this works. That's not going to inspire confidence in your abilities or anyone else. Um, or you go, hey, I'm going to roll out this change, and I hope we documented all the changes uh, and the steps between dev and production also not going to leave you with a lot of confidence and people where you can say, well, listen, we've done this on dev. It's going to be the exact same on production. We're not worried. That's easier. So on that point of getting into production, why not release your infrastructure code changes, your infrastructure changes exactly the same way as you do your code changes? We're very comfortable with the, you know, the, the loop for getting our code out, and we'll take a look at it now. Um, why not do that for our infrastructure? And then lastly, and one of the best um, benefits is that your environments look the same in terms of the shapes. I'm not saying that production and dev are exactly the same because in production you might have 50 web servers and you don't want to spend that money for 50 web servers in development if you're not going to use them. So they're the same in the sense that there's a load balancer, they're web servers, dev has two, production has 50. That's the difference, but that's they still look the same. So you don't have this weird difference between dev and production where you hope you know what you built in dev actually ends up working in um, production. There's another side benefit, and this is an interesting tweet I see. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the original source, but basically the tweet um, read that developers love great documentation. Developers also love creating great documentation, and then ends it off with only one of these statements are true. And this is fairly common. We all love great docs, but we don't like writing them. So taking us back to that initial sl or that slide that I had earlier, whereas imagine you've got someone joining the team and they're asking you, how do I actually make this change in terms of this infrastructure, or why is this piece of infrastructure here? I don't understand. Why do we have a queue with a dead letter queue with a timeout of five minutes, et cetera? Wouldn't it be awesome if you can just tell them, hey, listen, our infrastructure is code, and therefore uh, you can see the entire history. Um, have a, Like you would in the code, if you want to figure out what, why something happened and why it's being done in a specific way, you can just dig into um, the history, and you can actually see how things change over time without having someone to sit down and, and go through them. There's obviously value if you've got specific questions about decisions that you see in the code base um, to sit with them and actually talk. But in general, people are able to actually figure out what's going on because we are very used to this life cycle for code. We build the code. We send out a PR. Someone reviews it. Also on that PR, there are builds and tests that run to make sure that the code actually first can compile or passes the test if it's a non-compiled language. 
Then we actually get the code out into production with some automated fashion, and then we measure the code for performance and is it working the way it's supposed to. And then ultimately we start this um, cycle again by looking at how we can improve this. So let's say the code is slow, we can improve the art, uh, the algorithm, etc. Why aren't we doing this with a fire infrastructure? Um, well, you should be doing it for your infrastructure because when you get to this point, you can start rolling things out very quickly and safely. And the benefit here is that you start doing it in smaller and smaller steps because you're no longer wasting all of that time uh, automating um, this specific process, which is one of the major building blocks of cloud. You constantly change your infrastructure and add to it and make changes. And that's a benefit of cloud because guess what? You don't own the hardware. You can uh, swap things out, change things out. You deploy one virtual machine, you realize wrong family type. I need something with a bigger CPU couple of clicks or preferably automation and you set up no longer commitment. So think about that. So virtual machines, let's start talking about them a little bit in terms of how you need to think about them because it's not a case of, hey, I want a virtual machine, click spin up and we're good to go. No, there are a couple of things you have to think about before you spin them up. Um, and from my experience, um, I've worked at a quite a um, large number of different companies over the years. And it's not just like one Linux flavor that people use. It's are we using Linux? Are we using something else? Windows. Um, I've even worked on some, uh, what is the system, AIX systems as well. So the first question normally crops up is what OS do we use? I walk into a company day one, I wanna start building code, but what operating system am I building it for? Is it Red Hat, is it Ubuntu? Think about that. Uh, how do I patch that operating system? Because remember, old model was we had an ops team, the sysadmins that took over the care of the servers and they made sure everything was up and running there and um, I don't have to worry about it. But with cloud and with the whole DevOps uh, philosophy, these are things that I need to worry about. I need to know how do I patch my server. Um, then also, which version of Java do you use? Uh, I was in this uh, company at one point where I think we had upwards of 15 different versions. Because it was, for example, 1.6.1, sorry, 0.01b. And that was validated for a specific package. Because of the way the software was um, released and the requirements around um, uh, how we build things, they had to validate against a specific version. And that was a long process. So we had lots of different versions because we would can't just, because there's new version suddenly go through the process of validating everything. So figure out what actual runtimes you use or what do you need installed on it. Then also a bit more um, low level is libraries on the host. Do you worry about OpenSSL versus LibreSSL? And the other reason I specifically at this point in time know about this is that I tried to put some Ruby applications into an Alpine Linux container. And at that point, they're making the switch from OpenSSL to LibreSSL. And also learned about the uneven numbers uh, being the unstable ones and spent probably a week or two trying to fix this. So knowing what packages you're dealing with is also super important. And then the fun one always is that uh, what happens when Bob leaves? So you remember that document that's 600 pages long? Now imagine Bob was the one who initially wrote it and there was a mistake. Nobody picked it up because guess what? Nobody actually tested the document. Uh, now Bob leaves. Sorry if anybody's called Bob. He's just my go-to um, person for that I use in presentations. Um, you want to worry about that. So you need the documentation of how to actually build these VMs because often VMs are built by hand. Uh, you spend an hour or two or three clicking through things, setting them up. And then the fun one, and I'm sure a lot of you have dealt with this before, is that what do we do when there is a CV? Um, so these are um, vulnerabilities that get listed, um, and generally some of them are quite scary. You have to patch it on the day that they're released, um, because otherwise somebody can compromise your system. So now you start going like, Ooh, how do I actually fix my you know, host because I need to worry about this? Now the interesting thing here in terms of the culture you want to adopt at your company as part of this automation journey is that you need to make the developers understand that if you build it, you maintain it. Because we all love to write new features, we all love to get it out there and show people the new shiny features. We don't like bug fixes, and we specifically do not like to be woken up at 3 a.m. on a weekend to fix something that we wrote that's breaking. Now, once again, traditionally, that was the ops person's problem. They get paid at 3 a.m., they have to try and fix it, which also meant that they started pushing back when people want to send out new code, especially on Fridays, because guess what? If it breaks, it's my problem, not yours, who, um, uh, who's the person who wrote this. Um, initially, or sorry, additionally, if you write code and you know that if something breaks because of this code on a Saturday at 3 a.m., you're going to be the one that's paid, you probably will approach this a little bit differently. You might have more tests. You might be a little bit more cautious and think about, does this work or not? Versus just like, here's a code, boof, yellow. So how does that come back into the automation? Well, we want to create this golden path for our developers. Um, sorry, this is not a great picture. This is pretty much it that I could find for a golden path um, for unlicensed or license-free images. Um, but what Golden Path is, is that you want to create this journey for the developers and sysadmins and people building systems to take that makes it easy to do the right thing. Because when you make the right thing, the easy thing, people will tend to do it. Um, and the other lesson that I learned as part of this is that no matter how easy you make the right path, 
and um, how much you try and convince people. Some people will always push back against that, and they would prefer to walk on this path, uh, which is very prickly and very uncomfortable, but that is their choice. So when you define that nice automated uh, building block base path that's easy to follow, always understand that do not try to force people to take it. Show them value, convince them that, hey, if they use this, you are happy to help them and support them. But if they do want to be stubborn um, and not actually follow that route, they're entirely welcome to do so. But it's their problem. They have to deal with the thorns. Uh, you're not there to help them because you can't force people to do what they don't want. And not everybody believes in the value of automation. They feel like this worked for the last five years. I don't want to change things. We are good. So back to our VMs. How do you automate them? Well, here's a sample. Uh, using Packer, which is a product by HashiCorp, it's open source. You can actually define building up an AMI with this. And the line that I've highlighted there is it allows you to actually do a wildcard search for a specific version of Ubuntu, which is 18.04, 64-bit uh, architecture. And what it will do is it'll actually, um, if you look a couple of lines down, it says most recent true. So it'll grab the most recent version of this base image that you are building off. So you know that, hey, listen, I get a nice fresh copy of Ubuntu. Now what do I do to it? Well, I build my base, um, um, let's say, uh, things into it that I need, and then I call this my golden base image. And let's say we do things like we update it and we patch it. So now I've got, let's say, on a Sunday, timestamp um, uh, 1 January, uh, although nobody's going to deploy something on 1 January, hopefully, because they're still on leave. Um, but this is now your golden image, so you know that I've got a fresh Ubuntu, it's nicely patched, we are good to go. Now what you start doing is you say, okay, cool, well, let's build some more VM-based images because we've got different requirements. One requirement might be to run a Java system using 1.901b. Now what you can see over there is instead of looking for that other or some other um, operating system, I'm looking for that specific golden base, once again making use of that asterisk to do a wildcard search for all of the images with that name, and then it also grabs once again the latest one. So I build my base image. Then I built my Java image, and now my Java image is using that latest one. So I know exactly what the base is for the Java image that I start off with. Um, and as you can see over here, I'm passing in the um, version of Java as a parameter because I have actually built my uh, automation to understand how, which, uh, or how to install different versions of Java using Packer. Then lastly, what I do is I, I tag this specific VM with that uh, Java version and a timestamp. Because remember, I always want to know when was an image built because I might need to go patch it and figure out does it have a specific vulnerability in or not. And you can automate things a little bit by hand. You can, for example, add this section where you want to install extra bits for that specific version. And why this is useful and important is that at the end of the day, you end up with this nested VM um, base stack that you can use inside your company, which is there's the golden image that you know it's got all the base tooling in. And then you go into the language specific ones, like let's say Erlang, Java, and Ruby. Um, all languages that I had to work with. Erlang is interesting to get going. Um, and for example, with Java, you've got multiple different subversions of it. And now what you do is you tell developers, here are the golden images that you can work with. You don't have to worry about installing Java, configuring it. It'll be on these images. Just make sure you use the right version. So this is a very easy way for them to pick the right version with all the right tooling and patching, et cetera, installed in it. So now that we know we want to build VMs, there are a couple of things we have to fix um, or not fix, uh, take into account. Now, just a quick one here. These will all be things that I broke. Uh, so I can talk at length at how I've broken things before. Uh, but the first one is the fun one. Is it able to boot? This might sound like, a, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you bringing this up? Surely a VM can boot? Well, not always. Um, I had a scenario many years ago where uh, the cloud billing was still, um, I think, per hour for an instance. It wasn't like per second, like it is commonly nowadays for any VM. And I had made a mistake with my automation, something that literally as the uh, image came up, it immediately broke something, the networking, I believe, and the instance couldn't connect, so it was shut down again. So what would happen is we've got cloud, we've got auto-scaling groups, great. If an instance doesn't come up properly, we just replace it. So instance comes up, 30 seconds later, it doesn't work, down, up, down. That went on for about an hour or two before I realized something's not quite right here. Now, remember that bit about power billing? That was quite an interesting build to uh, work with and explain. Uh, what I learned is make sure that your image can actually um, boot. Um, second part is once it's booted, can you actually deploy your app on it? Because you might not be dealing with immutable infrastructure where you pre-install your app on your virtual machine. You might install that at runtime. So make sure you can actually get your app onto it and make it um, get the code or whatever it is that you want. And also make sure that it actually works because it doesn't help. And once again, hard lesson, I was able to deploy the app successfully, start it up, die, start it up, die. Um, I didn't build this into my automation pipeline to figure out, can I actually start up my app inside um, this virtual machine that I just built? 
Also, you want to make sure that your base um, VM doesn't have any of those uh, security concerns. And just quickly, the security concern over there is that, yes, there's a little caveat to it, which says um, there will almost always be some informational and low-level ones, but you can make an informed decision about this. For example, uh, GCC, which is the compiler for C, or one of the compilers for C, often has got some low-level and informational ones, or even medium-level ones. Um, it's often installed on by default on operating systems. Now, you can go, well, ooh, I can't use this base image. It's got a GCC error. Well, take a step back and think, do I actually use GCC in my flow? Or can I uninstall GCC? Um, because that might not be an issue. So always just be, don't be like, there's an error here. Because of that, I need to go spend all of the uh, time possible to go and fix this because you'll waste a lot of time for something that doesn't always really make a difference. So let's start looking again at this. And what I've done now is if you look at something that, let's say you build a VM once a week and it takes you an hour. And if you think about spinning up a VM, clicking around, shutting it down, saving it and doing it, an hour is actually quite fast. So over the next five years, that might actually be 10 days worth of your time. And remember that JSON that I just showed you for Packer that much? That's what you can do to start automating. So this is one of the very, very basic building blocks um, in terms of uh, automating your cloud journey. Then the next part is obviously being able to automate your deployments. Um, but what about we don't talk about deploying our, um, deployments only. We also want to automate our image building. Now, that Packer file that I just showed you, you can build it with a single command like that saying Packer build and your JSON file with those configs. Um, this is a sample for AWS code build, just that doesn't matter, but build steps. You build your golden image, so you now know I've got a fresh golden image. Then I build my Java image, next Java image. So you can tier them like that and you can parallelize if you want after you've done that golden base image uh, should you need to. So that's where the benefit comes in. And there's another interesting side benefit to this that I um, actually rolled out at uh, two different companies, um, which is this. Let's say I've built my base image and I've got the ability to automatically deploy my code onto this host as soon as it comes up again. What that means is let's say I have a image that once again was built one Jan. I really do not know why I pick one Jan because nobody's going to be doing that on one Jan, I believe. Um, and you've got three copies of that service running. Now you built a new golden image and this one is built at the end of Jan. And now we want to actually update our entire fleet. Now imagine having to do that by hand. That'll take a bit of time. Well, what you can do is you can scale up. So double your capacity. Because what happened now is you changed your auto scaling configuration to say, here's the new image that I want to use. Immediately double your fleet capacity. So we now have six instead of uh, three. And then what you do is afterwards, if you configure your auto scaling correctly, you can actually say terminate the oldest ones first, which means it terminates those old patched boxes first. So why this is important is remember those CVEs? Let's say you come in on um, the Tuesday morning. You've already baked in just the day before you rolled out the latest version, and now there's the CVE that has to be patched today. The steps you take is, one, build your new golden image and make sure that it's patched on there. Then build all the subsequent images for all the different language runtimes that you have. Then scale up, scale down. You're done. You can sit back, have your coffee, and you watch your fleet flip like that into the new image. You've patched your entire fleet without having to SSH into the host, worry about, did I configure this correctly in my um, uh, config management tool, etc. And speaking about config management tools, this obviously comes up like, surely installing the software as well as the packages and patching things are config management tool responsibilities, right? We've got these tools, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt. There's a whole host of these. And they are definitely still useful. There are still scenarios that I use them. The challenge, however, is remember the scaling scenario that I just told you about, is that let's say you have a fleet of servers and one of them, something happens, gets taken out of commission and we spin up a new one. Now what happens is that one was spun, spun up on a different day. And when your configuration management tool runs to install the base package or, um, or the packages that you've pinned, so even if you pin your version, that version might not be available inside the external repo anymore at this point in time. Remember these tools, a lot of them were to solve the problem before cloud where we've got hosts where they are very long lived and we want to try and manage configuration drift. Um, they are very, very good at that. Uh, and that was what they were built for. Whereas in the cloud, being able to replace a server, you can do in 30 seconds. So the, the, uh, the, uh, there's been a shift in terms of what to focus on and how to handle this. Because what I do now is, instead of trying to configure my server when it boots up, I just go, well, here's a prepackaged one with everything I need and I know exactly what it is. It'll always come up in the same way. Which means that when it goes into service, you can have some problems. So this, once again, is the point where some people start poking, but, you know, we don't have to deal with this anymore. We, you know, we've got Dockers, we've got containers. And uh, just quickly, this is a quick history lesson for those just to reflect where Docker comes from. I know not everybody is fully aware of it, but it started off with people dealing with the problem of how to get code to production. 
And then they solved it very easily, like this. So, kidding, obviously, just to make sure in, uh, in case somebody uh, thinks this is serious, but what it boils down to is when the code works on my machine, how do I make sure that it also works in production? And that's where Docker comes in and containers come in, because they really, really help with that. Now, before we all go like, yay, containers, let's move everything to containers, um, there's a bit of you know nuances around that. And I found this fun double con um, got in a while back because um, it like sums up, and you can replace Kubernetes here with a lot of different open source tools or um, any kind of tool, especially if someone's trying to sell you. Um, let's say if someone's trying to sell you a DevOps tool, yeah, think about just why, what are they trying to pitch you? Because they generally try and frame this your problems and this thing solves it exactly. So apologies for that if you hear my dog is a little bit naughty at the moment. Um, but what it boils down to is that when you start doing these new tools, often it feels like I've got a hammer, I know how to use this hammer, let me use it on every single problem. And not every problem is a hammer problem, I'm sorry to say. Because as this person illustrated, and this is all the way back in 2017, um, 24 April, is that Kubernetes, Yes, it's popular. Yes, it solves a lot of problems. Um, it's currently the golden hammer for everyone. It's like, oh, I've got a problem. I want to run a container. I want to do microservice. Let me, okay, boom. No, think about what the problem is that you have. Because if you think, for example, like um, a company that does a lot of packages, a fairly big one, um, I work for them. You might know them. This is what a warehouse internally looks like. This is not what day one was. Day one looked like this. This is the website from amazon.com back in the day when it launched. Very basic. Um, it did one thing, it did one thing well, and here's the kicker. It was actually a monolith in the background, and it was a monolith for quite a lot of time before it got to a point where this doesn't scale for us for anymore. So when you do containers, a little bit of guidance here. Don't always say, well, let's jump in with Kubernetes from the get-go, because especially on the startup scale of things, unless you've got a lot of experience with Kubernetes, it's going to take you longer to get things up and running than building it in the language that your developers are comfortable with and deploying it as a single monolith. So cool, building blocks again. So. We spoke about how to build the base um, VM images and nest them. Similarly, you can do the same with containers. You can have one from the other, from the other, from the other, because um, that's how you can actually nest containers. And also a little bit of advice here, always make sure that you've got a copy of the one that you want to use inside your own um, container registry. A uh, reason for this is something might go wrong, that external provider is down and you can't build. This happens often, uh, there's been a few recently, or things change. For example, um, a very popular one is now said that public images for non-paying customers will not be hosted for more than six months, which means that all of a sudden, when that new thing kicks in, your builds will break all over the show. You will not be having a happy day. So always try and keep a copy of whatever container it is inside your own container registry, because surely when you publish your, co uh, your containers, you're not going to publish them to public. You have got a private registry somewhere. Make use of that. Then let's quickly look at what a successful container is, because this is often overlooked as well. People just grab whatever the latest is off the internet, chuck their code in and boom, we're done. So firstly, we don't have to worry about booting, it's a container. We don't have to worry about deploying our app because it's installed in it. But we still have to worry about, can this container actually run our app? Because it doesn't help, like once again, being able to have a container and it just goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It's exactly the VM thing that we have, except it's now faster. It's in the order of seconds or milliseconds instead of like 20, 30 seconds between each cycle. Exact same problem though. Then also, doesn't have any CVEs. And once again, this has got that caveat saying, listen, you don't always take into account what packages is just because there's a CVE, unless it's like critical, then you definitely want to take a look at it. But if it's like medium or low, uh, use a bit of discretion. But also remember, you're in containers, so you can go and actually remove that package because you might likely not be using it. Take GCC again. On a host, you might need it for other processes at some point where it needs to be there. In a container with pre-compiled code, probably not. Take it out. Don't worry about it. Um, and also just a quick side note here, you can switch on scans for containers with a single checkbox if you were playing around with the ECR. But I'm not here to push Amazon products, unfortunately. Um, a lot of developers often use Docker deployments with latest. Now, I've seen a lot of documentation on this. I used to do this as well, and I didn't know what the issue was with that um, until I learned that basically you might also call this a, a YOLO deployment because let's quickly take a look at why. Let's say we've got a couple of our containers up and running for our current version. It's tagged with latest. Great. What you see at the bottom there is the actual SHA of this, which is uh, five watts. Now someone comes along and builds that out a new feature. They accidentally make some kind of mistake in that feature, and they build it. And now the latest tag is no longer that 5.1 build, but it's the 5.2 build because we reuse that latest tag. And now there's a scaling event. Traffic hits our site. We add more containers because guess what? This is what orchestration systems do. 
we scale up and down as we need to. But now we pull latest, and guess what? Latest is no longer latest, and we've got a mismatch of versions running in production. That's definitely something you want to do. So solution to this in terms of your automation building block is use that um, SHA that's generated with containers when you build them. Because then when you deploy, instead of saying latest, deploy with an actual SHA value. And what that allows you to do is that when somebody builds a new version, they can build that, but when you scale, you still scale with an um, other tag because you're using in a very explicit SHA hash for your container. So please, please, please use that because then what happens is when it is time to um, bump your version to the new one, you can flip out all of your containers and actually get them um, out there. Then the fun part of the automation talk is that says um, the best automation is no automation. And I learned this um, firstly the hard way and then the easier way. So there's this awesome quote that I found. And what this quote is about is that things that are simple um, are easy to understand, but sometimes you get a problem that's really complex. And if you can find a simple solution to that complex problem, that is a great way of doing it. Um, and that's what makes people happy. And that is actually what saves you a lot of problem uh, time because you don't have to worry about all the complexity if it's taken care of for you and it works. So a quick example again here is that, for example, there are wrappers, and this is just for ECS, but there are a lot of different open source projects with these kind of wrappers as well that take that massive complex thing and boils it down to a couple of steps for you. And that actually goes and um, makes it so you can spin up and create something complex with just a few commands and you don't have to do the automation because guess what? This takes care of the automation for you. Similarly, for example, when you start building a project and we all have to build some code at some point, um, I prefer using a make file. The reason for this is that regardless of what I'm building, is it a docking container, is it an Erlang project or Elixir project locally, it doesn't matter. When someone checks out the project, they go make build, make test. And that allows them to see, listen, can I build this project? Can I test this project? And all the complexity is actually built into that. So they don't have to worry about that. They'll get immediate feedback saying, sorry, you don't have Erlang installed or sorry, you don't have Docker installed, et cetera. And they can then go and solve that problem. But to get started, it's very simple and the behavior is easy. You do a build, you do a test. This is the side effect that developers will actually run this before they push their code. And the reason this is important is that I, at one point, worked with a person who had very weird working hours. He would start at 5 a.m. in the morning and then work till 3. And he was one of the people that when three hits, boom, I'm out the door, cheers. Um, and often it happened, it was a Java project. He would commit code at one minute to three, pack his bag and leave, not even checking if the code compiled, never mind if it passed the test. And the reason for this was, well, running the test locally is too hard. Um, it takes too much time, so I'm not going to do it. I mean, my time is here to code, right? I'm not here to debug, debug things. Meh. So yeah, make the right thing the easy thing. So using, for example, make files, make build, make test. That's not too much to ask for a developer in terms of the complexity to make sure that the code is working. Uh, similarly, like I said, the testing part. And then uh, what you can also do in terms of making the right thing, the easy thing is by making use of blue-green deployments because by building this in, and there's a lot of automation that you don't have to worry about because uh, often the cloud providers will take care of this for you, is that saying, listen, I've got an old version running, which is the blue, so first column. Then what happens is I bring up a new version, which is the green one, but no traffic is going to it. Then what I do is I flip my traffic to that one make sure that it's working. If it's working, I leave it and tear down the old blue one. If it isn't working, I just flip back to the blue one. And a lot of this kind of uh, deployments can be done for you with very, very little work on your side or actually no work. So once again, for example, if you're deploying to ECS, that one line at the bottom, that is what you pass to the deployment system late, saying, listen, please go do a blue-green deployment for me with this and I don't have to automate it. Once again, less automation is better um, for you because you don't spend and waste any time on it. Um, Sorry, that's where the, the line is that actually tells us to go do that deployment for you. Similarly, when you start thinking about canary deployments, and this is a very interesting newer feature, well, new-ish that has come up, is like, instead of doing that, what I just showed you, which is uh, bring use the old version, bring the new version up and send all the traffic to the new one, is what you do is you send a portion of the traffic across. So instead of um, sending all the traffic and things breaking and having to flip it back, you just send us a bit of that. Because what happens then is you start building up this confidence that, my version is actually working and it's according to metrics, it's responding in the right time. Uh, you can build in, for example, checks that says, did the API uh, error limit or error rate increase? Did the API response times increase or not? And based on that, you decide, do I send more traffic to it or not? Because this is a nice, comfortable way of doing it. And once again, getting back to the point of no automation is the best automation is that look at the systems you're building, look at the cloud providers, they often have this built in. It's a service that you can literally with a couple of clicks or a couple of lines of code enable and not have to deal with the complexity because I at one point did build this with bash scripts. It went horribly wrong. 
the funniest example of where it went horribly wrong was that I had a um, script that started and stopped my container for me and also then had to kill a process. And for this one project and only this one project, um, it would always kill the actual running um, deployment. And I was like, but there's nothing different between the scripts are the same, everything. What ended up being the problem was that when I decided what process to kill, I did a, um, a text search for, uh, I think it was archive. So I just said R-I-C-H. And unfortunately, that was part of the name of that specific deployment. So what happened is the deployment would firstly kill the other container correctly, but also kill itself because, um, you know, it's string match. So make use of the deployment available to you and don't spend time building things out yourself that you don't have to. Um, then to wrap things up, uh, these two books I cannot recommend highly enough is please go read them. They are super useful. Um, the first one on the left is The Phoenix Project, which is a narrative about um, this person who goes into organization and then starts bringing in what's known as like DevOps culture and the change and how they go about thinking it, how they deal with people and all of that. It's it's not a, a deeply technical doc, um, book, but it's it reads really easy. It's a story. Go read it. So at least read that one. And then the other nice one is Accelerate. Um, uh, so one of the authors, Nicole Forsgren, is uh, that PhD is actually in DevOps and research around how DevOps practices are adopted. It goes into the science of why do certain organizations do better than others? Why can they release more code per year um, more quickly and more safely without having outages? And what are the things they do? And they take a whole scientific approach to this through formulating the questions. They explain how they do that. And then also the important part is they share the learnings. So they tell you that we see that super successful companies do X, Y, Z. And also here's a questionnaire to figure out where are you in terms of your readiness and adopting of these practices. So spend some time on this. It'll really, really help you um, to go um, um, do that. And then with that, thank you very much. Um, like I said, just my social handles there at the uh, bottom. I do do quite a bit of live streaming at the moment, and I'm busy um, starting up my uh, YouTube channel thing. So if you find that useful, uh, thanks. Chat to you there. And also, like I said, Twitter or LinkedIn, please ping me if you've got any more questions or want to chat about tech at some. Wow. What a rundown this was. This was really a ride of a lifetime here. <laughs> so much material, and I'm pretty sure that the audience is going to be super happy when we upload the the post process recording of that of that talk. I mean, so much information, so much wisdom, so much experience, and yeah, I mean, while I was listening, it was like, yeah. We ran into that. We we had this fun, and especially the aspect like a colleague um, pushes the code and and wraps up for the day, and nowhere to be seen. <laughs> yeah. And then afterwards, you still have two people sitting in the office. It's like ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. I had, it, I had luckily it, it it's it's also a story of the past, but I can imagine it happens quite often. Or well, Shevin. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Very useful. Lots of tips. I really enjoyed the session. So we do have one question from uh, one of our community members. And uh, he's asking if you've been uh, using Pulumi and uh, what do you think about it? I've not personally used Pulumi, um, but I know about it and I've heard a lot of good things about it. And in general, my opinion here is that, for example, I work for AWS, so you would think that I would push CloudFormation or um, CDK. But my view is that use the tool that works for you because they all work in different ways. One, so if you think CloudFormation, that's quite a lot of YAML and JSON, but it gives you fine-grained control. AWS CDK, that's in a program language that you're familiar with, Java, C, Sharp, uh, Python. Uh, Terraform is in HashiCorp uh, configuration language, which is JSON-like, and it's got a slightly different approach and also does different infrastructure providers. So it's use the tool that you feel the most comfortable with, but I can definitely tell you, play around with at least two. Um, pick um, that and figure out which one will work for you. All right. Good. And I also like when you mentioned that like monoliths are, monoliths are okay. And you need to always go through microservices and go through all the complexities of mm -hmm. Uh, continue orchestrations and things like that. And uh, like, yeah, one more question. Yeah, so what would be the factors that you would take into consideration before deciding like whether you would go for the monolithical approach or like uh, microservices approach? Well, the, the short answer there is understanding the problem space because um, when you look at complex systems, a complex system is usually something, if it's successful, that it evolved from a successful, simple system that became complex because of the things that it's trying to solve. So if you know what, where you're heading, so 
let's say you know you're going to be building this big thing and you've got a team with people with experience building a microservice architecture and all the complexity that comes with that. Because remember, all systems have complexity. It's either in the code with a monolith or you're pushing it out into the infrastructure and how the services interact. But the complexity doesn't go away. It's just different. Um, if you've got that experience and you know you're going to need it, go that route. But I would still uh, temper that with make sure you need that because I know at the moment, in the market, everybody wants to get Kubernetes experience and everybody actually just wants to, you know, uh, run on Kubernetes because it's the thing that solves all your problems, right? Um, Kubernetes is incredibly complex. Um, so, yes, it solves some certain problems very, very well and it's very well suited to those problems. But always just make sure you have that problem. Because remember, spinning up a monolith and building, uh, setting up the pipeline to deploy it can probably be done in 10 or 15 minutes. And just spinning up a Kubernetes cluster is usually longer than this. And then you have to deal with, okay, I've got one part up, where is it running? all the other fun that comes in. So think about what you're building. Um, so the classic answer, it depends. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it depends. And, um, you know, in, in my personal case and experience, it's often the case that um, you're not starting on a fresh development. You have to deal with existing systems that customers come to you. It's like, uh, we have this... Um, whatever black hole of uh, <laughs> web applications with I don't know what support console applications and they come to you as like let's do a lift and shift and do some minor magic tweaking and suddenly everything is cloud ready and fully operational um, what would be your advice uh, in regards to that um for that one, it's 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 a pattern we see very often. Um, often people say lift and shift directly to the cloud, and you know we're now a cloud system. Yay! Uh, no, 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 no. You just took on some different aspects. Because remember, um, a famous quote by Werner Vogels, who's uh, Amazon CTO, is that everything fails and it fails all the time. So if you haven't had a cloud VM just disappear under you, you haven't lived in the cloud properly. And trust me, that will happen at some point. It's guaranteed. Uh, which means if you was on-prem, you're used to having a backup server and being able to just flip over. Now, unless you set that up correctly in the cloud, that's not going to be the same experience. So get it into the cloud so you can actually use it. First thing then is actually to take that instance and create a snapshot of it as is. So you know that I, if I need to, I can spin this up in this exact moment in time. Then start hmm. looking at how do I build up that base image so I can actually get there. Or, because there are different paths, you can then say, okay, cool, we want to skip directly to containers, so let's start and rebuild the app inside a container and get it up and running in parallel. And like with a Canary deployment, you can send uh, a copy of traffic to the container, make sure that it actually behaves the way it's supposed to. So that's how you build up the conference saying, we're not chipping away at making it more modern. Or, or for example, ripping out certain things that the app depends on. A classic example is, let's say, RabbitMQ. Uh, you can replace that mm. with uh, Amazon SQS, as is almost um, directly, which means that that's one less thing for you to worry about. And you start chipping away at these individual things and start seeing, well, kind of maybe bring in some um, lambdas to um, run, etc. So don't do big steps because big steps break. Yep, yep, yep. And yeah, that's a good, great takeaway. All right, then, um, Kobus, thank you so much for your time um, presenting here at the Virtual Developers Conference. I hope we stay in touch. Um, it would be great to welcome you, probably Amazon AWS, maybe for, for next year's mm -hmm. conference. Then hopefully you find the time and uh, health conditions and pandemic regulations allow it that you actually come mm -hmm. over to Mauritius. That would be fantastic. And um, again, thank you so much. And um, looking forward to meet and exchange on other matters soon. Okay, cool. Thank awesome. You. And I'll see you um, on Friday for the second session. Yes, latest then, exactly. exactly. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to promote it shamelessly, come on, give us your stay for Friday. <laughs> so th that 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 talk is actually going to be a lot of fun because it talks about resiliency in the cloud. So how things fail and how to think about failure in the cloud. Um, and during the session, I'll also share um, the details of two people uh, that are working and doing a lot of work in that space because chaos engineering is an extreme amount of fun where you break things on purpose to make sure your system works and. It isn't just about let's switch off a database server in production and see what happens. It's it's slightly more nuanced than that. So it's actually quite a uh, quite a fun talk to think about all the different things that can go wrong and how to address them. Sounds like yeah, a lot of smashing. Looking forward to that. Hulk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hulk smash, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> cool. Come awesome. On, thank you. Thank you. See you then on Friday. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.
Wow. I mean, I'm still kind of blown with all these uh, quick information and samples. I really liked this this uh, metrics about yeah, um, yeah, the decide how much time it takes you and how much to, to actually do the task compared to how much time it will take you to automate it. And uh, I think this is pretty, uh, pretty helpful because um, if, you know, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, which is not the case, mm-hmm. because you really need to look into it about, okay, is it worth your time to to invest into automation? Uh, how often is the task uh, uh, repeated? And things like that. And I think this was really a, a great uh, example of, of about how to go forward with it. Yeah, and also it's a great, great like metric that we can all use and apply in our day-to-day work to take decisions like, whether we need to automate it or, or not. Mm. Yeah, very good stuff. And it's also good to see the like collaboration of someone from AWS jumping in. It's uh, very exciting. Yes, it is, it is. Cheers for now and stay tuned. Thanks.